Many of us have no idea what it's like to be thirsty. We have plenty of water to drink. Even the water in our toilets is clean. But many people around the world don't have that luxury. Every day, about 1400 children die from disease caused by unsafe water and poor sanitation. That's 1400-1400. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are simple solutions like drilled wells, spring protections and bio-sand filters that help provide clean water to communities around the world. I asked a very special organization called Charity Water if they would be okay with me advertising for them on my podcast pre-roll when I do not have sponsors that give me money for putting them on my pre-roll. So I want to use this attention to talk to you about this problem that we have in the world. So Charity Water is an organization that brings clean drinking water to people. They are taking the money they get, it's 100%. If you give them $10, they will take those $10 and build clean water sources for people in need of water. We are taking a shit in clean water and that is pretty weird for those people to realize that do not even have clean drinking water. So this year I, de I decided to use their com campaign which is called Pledge Your Birthday. My birthday is in 29 days. I reached my goal of $300 within 24 hours. Thank you very much. It's pretty cool and it's heartwarming that people actually want to give. So check out the link in the description. Do something good with your money and go for two or three less coffees this month, this month and it will have an impact on someone else's life, please. I want to inform you that I started a Facebook community around my blog, my podcast, my videos where people can engage with each other that want to accomplish something in the music industry, may it be as a band, may it be as a solo artist. And you can go ahead in the description and click the link to reach the group and ask for access. We can share thoughts, grow with each other, help each other and just engage with each other. It's a place for like-minded people and I would be very happy to see you there. Now on to the main content of this episode. I have talked to my dear friend Mick from a band called Aversion's Crown. They're touring all over the world and they are doing 50 days shows like they know how it feels if you want to kill each other on the road. We go very deep into his background, why he started doing things, a lot of struggles, a lot of like how it is to come up as a band in Australia. And it's a very interesting subject. And please enjoy this episode. See you on the other side. <laughs> outlet so it's it, the morning in germany and it's the middle of the day in australia gold coast that's where you're from yeah am i right yeah so what did you how was your day what did you do today um well today is the first day i haven't been sort of totally screwed up by jet lag i've been sort of waking up every other morning about four in the morning and couldn't get back to sleep and Today I woke up about 7.30, so a bit more normal and, yeah, just got up and went to the gym and started doing some sort of more normal activities again and, yeah, starting to feel a bit more human, which is good. That's good. It's your, is 7.30 your normal time, like when you're not on the road? Uh, it's probably more like 8, 8.30 is probably a good okay. time for me, I reckon. So it's getting closer. That's good. Uh, what shirt are you wearing right now? <laughs> I'm wearing a Within the Ruins shirt. Uh, obviously. So you've been on a, you've played some, you, you've not been on tour with them, but you played yeah, some Yeah, we've dates. been on tour with them before, but yeah, this time we just did a, a few shows with them um, at the end of the Europe tour. That's the first time we're talking where there's no bands playing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. It actually is. <laughs> Okay, let's let's just jump into the into the deep chunk of this. Can you remember what got you into metal? Like what what was the Yeah, what? for sure. Um 
the first time I really kind of got that, you know, that hairs on the back of your neck standing up excitement feeling was um, when I remember watching, there's a TV program in Australia called Rage, which is, um, it's like they just play music videos and all that sort of stuff, um, kind of like a video hits or MTV or whatever. But I remember one time I was watching it and uh, this song called Until It Sleeps by Metallica came on there. Okay. And I was pretty young at the time and and I was just kind of like, what the hell is this? This isn't like all the other songs that are getting played at the moment. And and I kind of just, you know, I didn't know what to make of it at first. And then um, I think the next weekend I saw it again and it sort of just something clicked in me and I, you know, I just loved it. And ever since then I've kind of just been hooked on, you know, slowly worked into heavier and heavier music. But, um, yeah, that was the first time I definitely remember getting that excited feeling about that heavy metal sound. We, uh, what year was that? Like 80, 90? No. Yeah, that was 90s. Um, I was probably 96 or something, I'd imagine. And how did you, um, how did you, like, you, you wanted to know more and more and more? Like, did you go to record stores or? Yeah, well, that's exactly what I did. I didn't have any sort of older brothers or sisters um, to sort of, you know, show me music and that sort of stuff. So I kind of just, um, you know, through friends and um, just sort of figuring it out for myself. So, yeah, uh, you know, I'd, once I started high school especially, there were, you know, friends who had older brothers and sisters who would sort of hook them up with tapes of albums that were coming out at the time and started discovering a few new bands and then I'd go into record stores and sort of literally just look at things with covers that, I thought looked cool and take them up to the counter and ask to listen to them and, <laughs> and just slowly started sort of learning about different styles and, you know, reading magazines and all that sort of stuff. There wasn't even the internet or anything back then. So I just kind of, you know, it was all just sort of asking people and, you know, I'd even just going to gigs and you'd see someone wearing a t-shirt that I thought was cool. I was like, all right, well, that band's going to be cool. And I'd sort of try and track down some of their albums or whatever. And yeah, it was a totally different way of learning about music and bands than what it is these days. Do you, <laughs> do you, do you know the moment like when you back then, when you see someone with a shirt and you're like, fuck, this is, it has to be amazing. And then you listen to yeah. it and oh, it's, man. it's awful. It's shit. <laughs> yeah. It, that still happens. <laughs> it's amazing how, how, uh, you find out about stuff in metal. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah. Um, how did I that remember, lead um, you into, did, did you, sorry, the delay is awful. Like it oh, makes, right, it makes yeah. me sound like I'm breaking into people's sentences. <laughs> yeah. How did that lead you into um, playing guitar? Did you, did you just want to make it yourself? Yeah. I've, I'd always played musical instruments since I was younger, I started off on like piano and, and oh, okay. then I sort Same of joined, here. joined the brass band, um, in primary school. And so I was always playing instruments and stuff. And then, um, yeah, when I was in high school and, you know, I was kind of still trying to, you know, I was playing like in the school bands, but I was really starting to get into, you know, the heavy metal stuff. And, and it was just kind of frustrating that I couldn't play any of that sort of music I listened to on the instruments I was playing. So, I had a um a music class and I had this you know this young guy teaching me in in the class and he kind of just showed me how to play a couple of little bits on guitar and he showed me how to play into Sandman and I was like oh my god that this was is my cool. first riff like, as well yeah that was my first riff so I was like all right well I need to learn more of these things and then yeah there was an old acoustic guitar at home and I just sort of started learning some more Metallica riffs and yeah and just sort of went from there. They just had something for everyone. Like there, there was something you could learn at, at all times, and it was so amazing. I had a Master of Puppets cassette, oh, and yes. I of course couldn't play anything of that. No, but Enter Sandman was perfect for starting out. Oh yeah, definitely. I thought it it can't be like smoke on the water or uh, nothing else matters. It can't be the only easy stuff on guitar. So. When did you yeah. buy your first like metal guitar? When did you play electric? Yeah, um, it was. I don't know it was probably 
not too long after that. That was sort of happening, I think, towards the end of whatever year that was. So it was leading up to Christmas, and um, and I was just so into it, and you know. But obviously, yeah, it was an acoustic guitar, and you, you couldn't get that sound you're looking for. So I was just kind of like, Look, I need to get an electric guitar, and just got like a real basic one with like a little combo practice amp, and probably a Strat. Uh, it was a Yamaha, actually. Yeah, I had so, a y- Yamaha Strat. What was yeah, my Yamaha Strat? Yep, sick, bright red. Yep. Mine was black, <laughs> black and white. From uh, do you have? I know you, you guys have Aldi, the German supermarket. Yes. I don't think you have. <laughs> I don't think you have Lidl. It's uh, no. like it's it's just a copy of that, but a different company. So I just uh, we went to a supermarket, and there was this guitar, and I couldn't play guitar, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> "Mom, uh, sorry, but you have to." buy this guitar so she didn't buy it and i of course didn't have any money so we went back home and i kept talking about guitar 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 so we went back <laughs> to the shop and she said you can't play any guitar please promise me you will learn to play guitar so she <laughs> bought it and it couldn't stay in tune but i would play for eight hours a day and sometimes skip school like leave home pretend to be going to school wait till she leaves to work go back home and play guitar <laughs> then <laughs> leave home <laughs> and come back and it, i was out of tune all the time but it was like even with this shit guitar that was uh was pretty sick just to play Ender sandman for two hours in a row <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how did What was your first band? It, I, it was, of course, wasn't Widow to See. Am I right, or was it? No, no, it wasn't that one. But um, yeah, I've, I started a band in high school, um, uh, just with there was another guy who um, he was in my grade. He sort of he turned up sort of midway through high school, and he was just so much better at everyone, uh, better at guitar than everyone. And he was, you know, miles ahead of me on guitar, and so. I started hanging out with him and learning some stuff and we just started sort of jamming on, yeah, just Pantera and Metallica and he was ripping ripping through all the Pantera solos already and, you know, I was just riffing away and, yeah, we just started writing some tunes and got another couple of mates on board and, yeah, just started sort of jamming and it never really kind of got anywhere but, um, you know, it was a good sort of way to to just learn how to form a band and, was um and then from there a couple of those guys and me started another band and and then I've uh, started a band in school as well with some guys in my class and yeah just sort of was always I've kind of always been doing bands since that point if one band finished I was already working on the next one or something's already yeah in place so yeah I've just kind of been doing some kind of a band since I was I don't know maybe 14, 15 years old, so a while now. So, but people uh, people have to remember that this is in an Australia context, so cities are very, 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 very far apart. So yeah. every, everything that happens is probably just in your own city and you're not like doing something with someone else from another big city because it's way too far away. And I mean... Before social media, did you even know any people from other cities at all? No, that, that, like that played I didn't, music. Yeah, not at all. No, I just knew just the people in my little city, my little bubble, um, and yeah, I just go to watch all the local bands, and occasionally a band would come from interstate, and it would be like a big deal. But um, big fucking yeah. big deal. Yeah. I remember that feeling. Fucking big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you, uh, what, can you remember the first song you wrote, like? Yeah. Um, and how, yeah, and how, those... and how did you, like, how did you, uh, manifest what was in your head? How did you write it? Yeah, well, um, it was kind of like a combined effort with a couple of these guys that I was jamming with back then. And 
I kind of had a couple of riffs. One of the other guys had a couple of riffs, and I was just like, ah, oh, you know, these don't bloody work together. But then we kind of changed something around, and all of a sudden all these different riffs came together, and it was kind of that first time I got that real cool buzz of um, creating music with someone else where you've both come in with two totally different ideas and you somehow make them work together. And, um, yeah, and then we had this other mate who was – sort of playing bass with us and he started writing some lyrics and they were terrible. They were, he had this this big statue of this bird sitting on top of his um, his desk at his, in his bedroom and he was sitting there trying to think of what to write lyrics about and apparently this statue of this bird just fell on him and <laughs> fully busted him up. So he wrote this whole song about that. And, um, yeah, it was, it was ridiculous. But at the time it was the best thing ever. Did, you didn't have a drummer? Or am I getting No, that we right? didn't even have a drummer at that point. We were just sort of, yeah, doing it without drums. And, yeah. So it was just you guys meeting up. It was just riffs and yeah, everyone's just, bringing yes, his yeah. combo and you're just playing. Yeah, we didn't have any recording gear. We didn't have anything like that. It was just turn up, riffs, let's see what happens. Like I remember doing that and now in the... In the context of my 2017 musician world, it's it would be so weird to to do that, <laughs> like oh, not re not recording anything, just <laughs> sitting there and riffing. <laughs> but it's yeah. but it's cool that we wanted to do that, and when we were younger, and it was the best thing ever. Oh, it was yeah. So did, did that these actions or these what you were doing back then? Did you? get an idea of what it's going to be when you're an actual musician? Did you want to be a musician? Like, did you? Uh, did not, re not really. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, back then it was just kind of like something that I thought was, you know, it was just fun to do. Um, I love playing and, you know, I love jamming. And, but I was still back then, I was just like just a full fan, like watching other bands and stuff. I never really could sort of visualize myself being in a band that was actually playing gigs and touring and stuff that to me never even seemed like a, a possibility. And then, um, I don't know, then all of a sudden there was a couple of bands from my city that kind of got a bit of attention and started, you know, getting a bit of hype around them and touring and stuff. And that, that's when I kind of realized, well, you know, maybe you can do it. And, um, and that's when I sort of started thinking about things a bit more seriously and, And, you know, actually kind of thinking, right, well, I need to start booking gigs and I need to start, you know, meeting all other bands so I can book gigs with them and just started the whole process, thought process of networking and all that kind of stuff. You realize that you have to take action and it's... Exactly, you have, yeah. You have, to do, you have to do shit and no one's... You have to do gonna, shit, yeah. No one's going to come and get you. Nah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, what age was that? Um, yeah, that was, I was still in school, so probably like, I don't know, maybe 16 or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yes. doing doing all this, what was your... I'm, I'm drifting off the band thing a little bit, just because uh, I think background is really... I like to have background on people. What was your yeah. first? What was your first job and how bad was it if it was bad? Yeah, well, um, first job I got was when I finished school. I never like had a, a you know a proper job when I was at school, but um, yeah, once I finished high school, I was working. Uh, actually, you probably remember because you were in Australia for a bit. There was a, I don't know, there still is. There's a like an electronics chain called Harvey Norman, and uh, yeah, they just sell all kinds of electronics and bedding okay. and furniture and stuff. And so I just worked in the warehouse. So I was just literally just in the warehouse, just people would buy stuff. I'd just go and lift it and, you know, put it in the car or <laughs> deliveries would come. Okay. I'd lift them off trucks, put them in the warehouse, like just a completely brain-dead physical job. What is my purpose? But, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, at the time I was like, you know, this is fine. Like it was making me some money and, you know. Like you're uh, – I remember the the minimum wage isn't too bad in Australia. Like you can, or I I don't know how is the. Is it still bad 
do they have minimum wage in Australia or is it okay? Because everything is expensive as fuck. So yeah, I, I, I mean, like minimum wage. Yeah, it's like twenty twenty dollars an hour or what? What is it right now? Yeah, I mean, right now it'd be you know probably as a if you depending on if you're working as a casual employee or full time and stuff, but maybe twenty to twenty five. Um, dollars an hour, I'd imagine, um, from pretty much anywhere. But the Which, cost, I mean, is, the cost of living is like triple the amount uh to the USA, right? Like, yeah, I think it is. From what people I've met have, you know, we try and kind of, you know, you have this discussion with people on in other places in the world, and you try and sort of figure out the maths about how much what your your earning is worth where you live. Versus what the, you know, yeah, their situation. So it's, it seems like, yeah, where we are, the cost of living does definitely seem higher, and um, yeah, we may earn a bit more than some other places, but maybe it doesn't go as far. It's hard to tell. But if you go to, would you say Europe? Uh, are there expensive places for you in Europe? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I guess Norway example, and Scandinavian countries yeah i haven't been to norway yet but okay. places like sweden and stuff but uh switzerland always seems oh, switzerland super expensive is to us killing switzerland yeah, is it's killing. crazy you pay like yeah, 10 so euros expensive. for a kip up or like you i it feels like you're paying 10 euros for everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, it does uh, yeah. 10 euros is the minimum like it's the cheapest product at all yeah Yeah, I remember going into a Starbucks there the first time I was in Switzerland and I ordered a coffee and a toasted sandwich and paid for it and then sort of worked out the, the transfer or the exchange rate or whatever and it was about 30 Australian dollars or something, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, so you did that elect electronic store job and you played music on the side or was that just to figure out what you want to do in the future? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew I was gonna. I went, wanted to go to university and study music um, after I finished high school. So yeah, I worked all summer and um, the whole uh, to get into university for music. It's pretty much completely an audition process. So it's um, yeah, it doesn't matter so much about how your marks were in school for. And for a lot of it, it's basically you rock up, you do an audition, and it's yes or no based on that. So I was auditioning for a bunch of universities straight after I finished school and then kind of had to sit around for a, you know, a month or two waiting to see whether I got accepted into the ones I wanted or not. And um, so, yeah, I was just kind of working until I found out if I'd uh, yeah got into it, and I ended up getting into the, the one I wanted to do. So Which yeah, one was that? The, uh, it's... It was called Southern Cross University up in Lismore, so um, it had a pretty renowned music program up there for, and it was wasn't sort of so much jazz or classically streamed. Um, it was called a contemporary course, so it kind of touched on all sorts of different styles, and it was really um, guitar focused. The yeah, the course I was looking at, so yeah, it was really good. The, the lecturer there was kind of a renowned you know, guitarist around Australia and, um, yeah, it was, yeah, I was pretty lucky to get a place in that one. So yeah, that was kind of where I ended up after school and yeah, it was study there for four years and was just kind of working jobs. And I started, that's when I started doing some a bit more serious stuff with, uh, heavy metal bands. I started, um, yeah, it was kind of a, a band, That where, been where, where, some sort of, which in which state was this school this university it was in northern new south wales so um the closest is, sort of place that, is that people where, know of is, is that where cairns is no no is it no cairns is quite far north in queensland so oh, that's queensland okay yeah so northern new south wales it's kind of near byron bay uh, that's the sort of a landmark most people would know i uh, yeah um, i know that from everyone wants to go there and live Live, yeah. live life and be a ghost or something like all the backpackers yeah. want to go there oh totally yeah and it's gotta you be, can see why when it's gotta be go there, packed but... with backpackers i've never been there but it's it gotta is. be gotta be packed totally is yeah 
And there everyone's wearing these really, really big sh pants, and yeah. everyone's got dreadlocks. And I, oh, and yeah. then there's some locals. That's how I imagine yeah. that. And and a beach. Yeah, yeah. That's like pretty much exactly what it was the whole time I was there. And <laughs> now it's kind of evolved a little bit, and you know, everyone's wearing clothes made out of felt and felt hats and fucking all that kind of rubbish. But um, yeah, I still like Byron. Is that far from you? Uh, it's about an hour from where I live at the moment, so okay. not that far at all. Okay, that's not that's five. It's like five European minutes. Yeah, exactly. in driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, how do you say that? Like, did you finish that school? I did. So I, yeah, it was four years of study there. Um, so I finished that, but yeah, while I was studying i was doing some bands um yeah i sort of started a well i joined a, a band that evolved into something else and we were kind of it was kind of that time when um parkway drive and i killed the prom queen and those kind of mm -hmm. earlier australian metalcore bands were just kind of starting out and so that was kind of the the scene that was nearby and obviously i was nearby and so i was kind of going to all these early metalcore gigs and so I was like, all right, this is the kind of band I need to do. And so I started sort of, you know, doing that kind of stuff and playing those sort of gigs and just doing some sort of smaller scale interstate trips and a little bit of touring and stuff like that. And, yeah, it was um, nothing sort of, you know. Putting in, putting massive, in the but, grind. Like, yeah, putting in the grind, exactly, yeah, yeah. That's what a lot of people miss. Like you have to... I don't know what the equivalent today would be because I'm not a starting out musician, but there has to be an equivalent to that, what we did 10 years ago. And it's, yeah. sometimes it's not fun, but for the bigger picture, it's absolutely what you need to do. Like connect with people, go to places, see shows, drive for four hours. And, you know, do you remember the first time when you saw... Um, like the changeovers on big shows when they oh, and you're like oh man like okay that's how it works i need to be more efficient <laughs> like absolutely they, they are yeah. so fast <laughs> and then they are they're not playing a riff to show off on line check they're just doing some sounds so they absolutely. know if the line's there and that's the whole purpose of that yeah and i need to tell my guys to not jam in the line check and it's all this stuff oh, yeah. man and i i wouldn't have known a lot of stuff if i didn't go and watch other people do th this stuff yeah absolutely yeah and things like that i still see it happening to this yeah, day like absolutely even that last tour i just did and you know bands are using that line check just to show off all the riffs they know and stuff and you just like oh, what are you doing like did you have a lot of no. local acts on there? Um, not, not heaps, actually. It was maybe the first week or two. That, okay. um, yeah, the, the sort of when we were doing the headline shows, we usually had an opening act, like a local one, um, for pretty much all the headline shows we did. But after that, no, that was pretty much just when we were the sort of support band, um, we would usually be opening or there'd be another kind of established band as the opener and, yeah, so, yeah, it wasn't heaps of local bands this tour, but, uh, yeah, there was still a few. Okay. Um, so, you started doing bands, and then did you meet Widow, Widow the Sea guys in this period of time? Yeah, it was not too long. It was kind of just after I finished university. I moved to the Gold Coast, and, yeah, I was sort of trying to get some new sort of a band up and running, and... Um, yeah, I was so you, sort all, of working. you already knew people in Gold Coast? Yeah, I knew a couple of people there. Okay. Um, uh, and I was like, yeah, just kind of had a few yeah, few people I knew. But um, yeah, I was just trying to find the right kind of guys to get a new band happening with. And yeah, I was sort of jamming with a few different things at, at one point. And then, um, yeah, the Widow the Sea guys just kind of, I met yeah, the singer at the time and... Uh, the twin brothers who were in the band and that was kind of, yeah. So I was sort of working on three different 
things at that point and I was like, I just got to pick one thing and go with it and yeah. uh, and that was the one to me that just had the most potential and I was like, yep, yeah, I'm just going to put everything into this one and yeah, just worked on that for the next how many years it was. Uh, what's what's going on there? Like, are you? Is there something happening with Widow to Sea, or is it is everyone so involved in? I don't know. You are with Aversions Crown, then is someone working a ridiculous job, or? Yeah, um, like there's nothing nothing happening at this point. Um, we're all kind of still in touch with each other, and yeah, you know, all still catch up and hang out and stuff like that. But um, yeah, nothing happening musically there at the moment. Everyone's kind of doing other things and which is cool but uh i mean there's always the potential for it to to happen again at some point which i'd be i'd always be keen to to do that but um but yeah, you, we'll you didn't end you didn't end it or something it's like no we didn't end it it's just kind of okay just not not active at the moment but uh yeah there's no reason it couldn't happen again so at some point a version's crown which is a band on Nuclear Blast, which is the biggest metal label on Earth, I guess. Yeah. Maybe besides Roadrunner. I, I don't know which one is bigger. I, I don't... Maybe Nuclear Blast has the most... more bands. But it's it's yep. not the point. So this band uh, came and asked you to, to... to come on tour or to play guitar straight away. How was... how did that work? Yeah. Um, they had a, a member... Um, who sort of moved into Thy Art is Murder. Oh, okay. So they had a yeah, they had an opening for a guitar player. Is that the <coughs> is that some, the guy with the mustache? Uh no, the guy with the mustache is Sean. Uh it was Kevin. So he plays bass in Thy Art at the moment. Okay. And he has for the last how many years, probably since I joined, so at least three years or whatever. Um so once he joined Thy Art, um Yeah, they needed a guitar player, and the singer at the time, Colin, he was he used to sing for Widow the Sea, so he knew me, and we'd worked together for years on the other band, and so he kind of just put my name in in the picture, and I kind of knew the other guys. We'd never really spent a lot of time together, but we'd um yeah we kind of you know we'd played a few shows and we kind of all knew each other a bit, so they basically just kind of said yeah like come and have a rehearsal with us, see how you go. And, and uh, yeah, I, I did a jam with them and and then they're like, yeah, sweet. That sounded good. Um, <laughs> next go. week next week we're doing a tour with Devil Driver and Whitechapel. And, yeah, Do you so want to come? Had, yeah, so I had one jam with them and then, yeah, it was only a pretty short tour, but it was a, an intense one um, just with massive drives and the shows were really big and, just kind of in the deep end straight away but it was good like yeah it was just gave me a taste of uh did, you know was that a big was decision become. for you like did you have to make any uh did you have to quit a job or something or did, did didn't you have any responsibilities at that point um i had definitely had responsibilities and job and all that sort of stuff and uh yeah but it was so i kind of just i didn't have to quit a job or do anything like that but i was prepared to if it came to that um i was just like this is it was kind of an opportunity for me to do things in music that i'd always wanted to do yeah and an opportunity that doesn't that hadn't you know come around before and may not come around again so i had to take it and kind of go with it and put everything into it which i've yeah kind of done and at the time yeah it was just i didn't have to make any huge sacrifices but i was prepared to make them if if i had to and, ready uh, to shoot <laughs> i know yeah, that i know that to, feeling yeah you're yeah. absolutely ready to quit everything the next second yeah if you have to you're, you're just going to do it so were they already touring in europe or was that before they went to europe yeah they'd done one tour in europe already so okay. earlier that year they'd been um and done a A full European tour, and yeah, it went went, went well. So uh, there was already talks of um, of going back again, and sort of the point when I joined, um, they were just sort of finishing off the uh, the Tyrant album, so it had pretty much all been tracked at that point, and they were just sort of just you know deciding who was going to mix it and 
doing some final bits of vocals and I did a little bit of guitar, okay. think, you know, just on one of the songs and, um, yeah. And so and basically just when that album was getting done, the nuclear blasting had just kind of popped up. And so, yeah, they were like, well, you know, we're looking at signing with this label nuclear blast. So did they, to- did they send them the demos or how did that, did you have a manager? Oh, you told me you have, This, you had the same management as Thyatis Murder, and then it went kind of that way? Yeah, I think that's pretty much what happened. I, it was kind of just before I was in the picture, but yeah, at the time we had the same manager as the as Thyatis did. He still manages us, but... um, They're doing a DIY, right, I think. Yeah, yeah, they have been for, for a while now, since then, basically. So, um, yeah, so he... I think he obviously had the contacts from them and there was a fair bit of hype on um, a couple of the singles that had been recorded already and, yeah, they were super interested and, you know, liked what they heard from the album and, yeah, decided to sign the band. So, yeah, and I kind of was just joining the band as all that was happening. So, that was, <laughs> you know, it was pretty exciting for everyone and yeah. it was, yeah, it was pretty pretty cool, exciting time for everyone. So when that album dropped, did the extensive touring start right away? Yeah, um, the album dropped and we did an Australian tour pretty much straight away. Um, and that was probably about a fortnight's worth of shows or something. And then, yeah, the European tour got booked for the start of January. So, yeah, I think it was sort of November the album came out. What year? So second half. Do- To 14? Uh, 2014, okay. would have been, yeah. So the album came out sometime in November, I think. We toured for a couple of weeks in November. And then start of January, we um, yeah, we'll, we played like a couple of Australian shows. We played a festival and another couple of shows. And then we were um, yeah, off to Europe. for That was my first, first time I'd even been overseas or you know, anything like that, let alone to So you never left to Australia that extent, so. to that point? Never, yeah, never. Yeah, why, why, why would you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> got, every, got everything you need. <laughs> Did you adapt to the touring really fast? I mean, you you toured quite a lot in 2015 and 16. Yeah, um, I mean, none of us had. I mean, the other guys had done one tour, but overseas, but um, so they had a little bit of experience already, but. You know, it was it was kind of everything I expected, and and a lot more, a lot of different emotions and feelings about you know going overseas and playing music to crowds that you know you would never expect to yeah. be doing and stuff like that. So it was it was super exciting, especially that first one for me. Like you know, every day was just kind of I was in a new country or a new city, and I was just like couldn't believe it. Really, it was you know it's something I'd always wanted to do and and to be actually doing it, it didn't kind of seem real at the time, I guess, but, um, you know, looking back and now I've done it a few times and, you know, you kind of, you know, you can yeah, really yeah, think about how cool it was to do it for the first time. And now you're just, you're just doing it. It's like you're, you're used to having eight hour layovers and at <laughs> like it, I, I didn't tour, uh on other continents no oh israel which is basically not europe so i did but uh is it so you you adapted to it you know what to pack it's like there's no no real uh adventures not not adventures but like surprises anymore no there's always surprises but uh it's i mean As far as, you know, getting on a plane, packing your bag, you kind of, you roughly know what you're in for now and, you know, you're, you're pretty much just mentally prepared for, for what you're about to do. Um, yeah, and, you know, the more more often you do it, you just kind of, you know, there's you just sort of know exactly, you know, how to deal with the surprises that do pop up every now and then. But, uh, yeah, you pretty much just pack your bag, get your guitar and get ready to not sleep for six weeks. <laughs> go, go gig. 
What's your yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's your first memory of going to going to Europe? Um, yeah, I mean, I remember just getting off at the airport in Frankfurt, and you know, just everything's big. It was just <laughs> everything's big, but it was just kind of you know that feeling of it was the first time I'd ever been somewhere where no one was speaking English. Like it was just just walking past people and hearing people talk and not understanding a single word of what was going on. And that was such a weird feeling where, you know, just growing up and living in Australia my whole life, you, you're just kind of used to it. And then all of a sudden you're in you know, another country and just hearing just a, a language you can't understand. And it was, yeah, that was really kind of cool. And yeah, it was that, I thought that was probably the first main memory I have. What, what did, did you play, uh, did you get picked up to play straight away or did you have some uh, one or two days to? Yeah, we had, yeah, we had a couple of days just to go in and kind of get our bearings. And so, you know, went into the city and it was the first time I got to check out, you know, a city on the other side of the world and, you know, all the architecture and the people and, you know, just trying to deal with public transport in another language, <laughs> and different currencies and stuff like that. And, And, all, yeah, and then you have out. to you like you have to buy a ticket for for public yeah. transport, and it's really weird. And even I don't understand it in other cities sometimes because it's totally. Then some take uh, take some take your card, some just take coins, some take everything. Sometimes <laughs> you don't know, and sometimes uh, I end up not buying anything because it's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> And you can't ask, sometimes you can't really ask people because some people are not used to be asked stuff anymore because of the modern day we live in. Yeah. But yeah, it's good that you yeah, that you could pick up the whole culture shock before going to play. Definitely. Yeah. Hearing yeah. all the hard sounds like T's and uh, hearing a different language. Yeah, oh, it was crazy. Is there a what's the main difference between Europe, Australia, and America? It's I guess it's all of those are pretty different to to play shows in. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, I think um, yeah. In terms of like the you know the, the fans that come to crowds and stuff, they're all pretty pretty different in each one of those countries, um, and they're all kind of passionate in their own different ways, I guess. Uh, But um, yeah, I think European fans are always, you know, super passionate and excited about just the fact that we're from Australia and stuff like that. Which is obviously that's not a, a big deal when you play in Australia. You just, you know, yeah, you're from there, so it's not not that weird. But um, yeah, I think we just seem so foreign. Um, I guess you know, American bands probably tour Europe quite a bit. And I, I know there's a lot of Australian bands that, that do it, but uh, not as many, I guess. So yeah, some people have never never seen an Australian person, and yeah, <laughs> some of them yeah. maybe think like you look different than they do, and but you're all just Europeans. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's pretty weird. Um. Is there is there anything that European musicians would definitely think is really weird about playing in Australia? Yeah, I think um, the way sort of shows are run in Europe is, you know, to me that's kind of the pinnacle for, for when we're touring. You know, you kind of turn up, there's food ready for you, the venues are, you know, clean, they're got good equipment and stuff there. There's usually staff that'll help you load in and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you'll, you know, there's it, a never ending supply of beers and whatever you want to drink. Um, you know, they'll give you a hot meal before you play. There's usually a shower there, towels and all that sort of stuff. And uh, often there'll be accommodation provided sometimes at the venue or through a promoted company. They'll put you up in a hotel or, you know, even, find someone's house to stay at for you and stuff. Whereas in Australia, you get none of that stuff. Like you turn up and, you know, you're basically just like, all right, you guys can load in now. And then from then on, you're just kind of on your own. And 
do whatever you, you want. Might, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, you might get a couple of drink tickets for the bar, but um, you know, that's pretty much about it. You are kind of just on your own, which I guess kind of um sets you up for when you go overseas and you're you're touring and you you're just kind of used to sorting yourself out with all that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I think. If I was a European band and I'd toured over there for quite a while and was kind of used to all those creature comforts and came to Australia, it might be a bit of a a bit of a shock. I see. Sometimes I see tour pictures from Australian shows, and the shows are in hotels. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do they like? Yeah. Do people book conference rooms in hotels to make metal shows in. Is that what happens? Or it's it has happened, yeah. I mean, uh, it doesn't always happen, but yeah, sometimes there's uh, there's always weird issues with venues in Australia. Um, there's not, you know, we don't have the kind of venues that sort of stand the test of time over here. Even our iconic venues that have been around for years always kind of end up getting demolished or bought out or stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's it's always kind of promoters are always facing that battle of where we're going to put our next show on because the venue we've been using the last couple of years is now unavailable for whatever reason and okay we need to find a solution so so sometimes yeah they'll end up being in weird places or you know conference rooms or whatever it ends up being but uh yeah it's it's a yeah it's just a kind of a different situation over here i guess and different laws and stuff like that which Seems like it's really hard to build to build a culture, in like in Cologne we have this underground thing, and that's yeah. like where most of the shows happen because the size is perfect, and like you can park your bus there. You can like even when you're not playing there, they will probably let you park your bus and get power. Just like give them fifty bucks or something, and that's like yeah. And there will be another band playing that you probably know. And it's like, I couldn't imagine the, uh, a country where, where it's not like that. Because I remember <clears throat> even going out in Australia, like going to grab a beer in a live club. It's kind of really weird because maybe they won't let you in with short shirt sleeves because you have tattoos. They You can't go in if you have a belly bag. A bum bum bag, yeah. like bum bag, yeah. It's 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 actually really hard to get to go into something <laughs> and actually it is yeah. see something and buy because there's so much rules. There's so many rules you have to follow in these kind of districts with the life clubs. Yeah. I was oh, like, absolutely. okay, I'm about to go home because I no one will let me in with my tattoos. So I remember in Adelaide, there's this party street. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. There's no, all, all the bars and tattoo shops, and then they, they, I couldn't go into any shop. And my friend, he didn't have tattoos, so he said, "Let's talk to any security that doesn't look intimidated and ask him where we can go." And he looked at me and said, uh, "Yeah, you, you, there's probably nothing you can go into. So I would go home and get a long sleeve, and then you can go wherever you want." and please get rid of that bum back. So I did. And then I could go into bars and I was like, what the fuck is going on here? But it's pretty normal there. And then you can't play shows. It's, it's, it's just really weird for outside people. Oh yeah, absolutely. Even if you live there, it's weird. I think so. And then they, they kick you out at zero 30 or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, please leave. Totally. And no, you can't finish your drink. Just please fuck off. <laughs> We need to <laughs> go home as well. Like, how can anything cool happen if you want to party after that time? Like, you have to, you have to have a lot of house parties, I guess. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. House shows are still a thing over here, and especially for punk and hardcore bands. Yeah, a lot of them will just do house shows because, yeah. And are there no are there choice. people people with specialized homes for that? Like, are there professional home show promoters? Oh, look, not that I know of. Okay. I'm sure there might be a couple out there, but yeah, I'm, I'm yet to find a professional house show. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a thought I have. 
Can you yeah. can you over overplay Australia fast? Yeah, you can for sure. Um, just because, especially when you're playing metal, um, it's yeah. hard to draw a crowd, even in the capital city sometimes. But you you really struggle to um, to play in the regional places without a, a pretty big following already. So yeah, if you you know if you just keep playing the same capitals all the time, you can definitely overplay it pretty quick and. Yeah, so I think that's kind of the point a lot of Aussie bands get to when they kind of make or break and they've sort of just about to hit that point where they've nearly overplayed Australia and for whatever reason can't make the next step to take it overseas. Um, and then they just kind of had a loss for where to go from there. Or, or and they then end it's up... fucking expensive to go overseas. Like you have to pay like yeah, exactly, $1,200, yeah. $12,000, $14,000 just to get in and out out and in exactly yeah and yeah i mean and you're you're you lucky don't. you don't need a visa to you don't need like a fucking expensive visa to go to europe or something not to europe no that's right but um i mean you know america as well as everyone about the american one man like yeah you guys had that whole yeah. thing happen and um that's happens to quite a few bands unfortunately and and then you know it's hard to recover from that it, it is man like it f fucked us up really bad But yeah. do do you guys have an uh do you always just refresh the visa every year, no matter what? For Well, for we've only just got our first ever visa this year. Okay. So yeah, But this the is process the was of, a pain in the ass, I guess. Yeah, like <laughs> it was. And super stressful, like you know, I got a heap heap of new grey hairs from that and uh yeah, it was we literally we had a like our flights booked for months in advance. We'd done all the applications for the visa you know months ahead of time and stuff and we were flying out on a saturday morning and the visa came the friday afternoon like hours before Whoa, our flight fuck. and so we we had no idea if we were going pretty much up until the last minute so yeah it was just you know especially when you've invested that much time and money and all that into it and you sit just sitting there waiting like so, yeah, I mean, we were one of the lucky ones and it did happen for us, but it easily could not have happened, so. It's destroying, like, sitting there. You're you're basically waiting for an email <laughs> uh, yeah. for a very long time to just to give people an idea. You're waiting for an email and it's not coming. And then when they ask you a question, it takes them two weeks to reply to your answer to that question. So that's yeah. what fucked us up. So they didn't want, they wanted to know something and they wanted to know it one week before the flight. So they need two weeks to wow. reply. And when we answered that question, we already knew we're not gonna get it because it takes them two weeks to answer. Oh, so fuck. yeah, it's, it's insanely oh, stupid. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's going to get easier with the administration over there right now. Yeah, I couldn't imagine it will get easier. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to see it. I've never been to America. I want to see it one time and I, <laughs> I'm just going to go and get a tourist visa and just travel, like make holidays and actually see it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's Absolutely. that could be possible. But I, I heard people like uh get declined for just visiting Reg like uh israeli guy i know he didn't get into the country like no you can't yeah, come. Right. you can't come and visit it's holy shit it starts to get really weird three yeah, essentials a... that you always have to have in your backpack on tour what do you always take with you um clean socks that's like a a crucial one like feet feet start smelling really bad really quick on tour and if you haven't got clean socks and plenty of them like it it gets pretty bad in that van real quick so um yeah i usually stock up on plenty of socks before the tour starts and uh i reckon what else do i take like a travel pillow Like that's always um that's probably always always in the van yeah like you know i've 
you know, we sleep in all sorts of places like floors and vans and all that sort of stuff. So if you've at least got a little pillow to put your head on, at least at least your head wakes up feeling a little rested, even if the bot the rest of your body's kind of fucked the next day. But so and, people, um, even if you're a nuclear blast, the f sleeping on floors doesn't necessarily stop. It That's never stops. Just so people realize it. So they, um, I talk to bands a lot. They write me very personal messages and like, can you evaluate this? And they, a lot of people think, okay, I need a record deal and then everything's going to be all right. But the truth is it only gets harder after that. <laughs> like, It doesn't get easier. Yeah. You have to work more. Yeah. There's exactly your, yeah. uh, your band size increases the hustle. Like it always, yeah. it's always gets bigger. So do you take an, uh, do you have your big travel bag in the van and then you have a small bag to take things into the venue? Um, I usually just take one bag with me on tour because okay. because of the, the weight restrictions flying from Australia internationally, all of my check-in baggage is my musical equipment. So yeah. I'm just left with a seven kilogram carry-on bag, which has to be everything I need to live for two months. So that's all my clothes, toiletries, you know, all that stuff it has to fit into a seven kilo carry-on bag. So, um, yeah, I pack pretty light considering have, how long I'm away uh, for. It's, it's quite, uh, you have to adapt to a quite minimalistic lifestyle on tour. At least that's what I, what I think. Did you, have to adapt to it or have you always been like packing light and not taking too much stuff did you have to learn that uh i've definitely sort of i mean the first tour i did i probably packed way more than i needed yeah and you, you only know, learn you, it along you, the way yeah, yeah that's it and in terms of just clothes really like i just i packed way more clothes um than i really needed because you do still you know if you if you want to make the time, you, you can make time to do laundry and, uh, you know, venues over there will have laundry facilities and stuff like that. And so then, amazing. You know, you'll, yeah, and then you'll, you know, you'll tour with a band and you'll end up swapping merch with them and stuff. So all of a sudden you've got a couple of new clean T-shirts and and uh, things like that where you, it just kind of saves you a bit of, you know, clothing that you don't need to bring over there with you. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, the more I've toured, the, the less I end up sort of packing uh, to, you know, like yeah. I'd probably pack not that differently to go away for a weekend or something in Australia as I would to go on tour for two months in yeah. internationally. What's the hardest lesson you've learned about touring? Um, I don't know. I think it's just kind of like, you know, the hardest lesson is just making sure you, you know, you realize that there's no, no day where you can really just kind of slack off you know like you you kind of every day you're on tour and you know you might sort of feel one day like oh you know i don't really feel like doing whatever it is like selling merch or loading in or you know all that sort of just those monotonous jobs that you just have to do every day and yeah you, you just have to do them like yeah you just uh every day you have to do your jobs and yeah it's i mean it's kind of like just going to work really but uh you do it every day for a couple of months without having a day off and you know i love it still and but you know it's awesome. just a, a mental thing where you kind of have to be prepared like you know you're sitting in the van for hours and then all of a sudden all right we're at the venue and you just have to go into work mode and all right let's do all these jobs and then and then you can relax again so yeah i think that's kind of the biggest thing is just getting yourself in that in that mindset and For me to get into the playing mindset, it's never, you know, it's never been a problem. Like as soon as I'm on stage, got my guitar in my hand, and that's it. I just feel, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, all right, I'm, I want to do this. Let's play music. Like, but yeah, it's just the other bits. It's everything around it. Like playing is the easiest, the easiest part. It is, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's just you just have to do something cool for an hour. That's it. Exactly. Let's go into the last and crazy segment. It's not that crazy, but I called it like that. Uh, I call <laughs> it differently on every show. <laughs> um, what's, yeah. what's something that you really don't understand about our world today? 
yeah, I mean, I guess there's so many, like, you know, in Australia at the moment, there's, which it's, a, it's an issue that's been around for a while and a lot of countries have kind of already tackled it in their own way, but uh, at the moment there's a big issue. Um, well, it's not an issue, but it's it's coming to like a big vote for the same-sex marriage um, bill in Australia. And I heard that you know, on the Hard Noise podcast. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, and, you know, like for me, it's a no-brainer that... Like it costs a hundred million dollars to to implement it into your system or something yeah. like that. And I don't, I really don't understand how, like, why does it cost that much? Can't you just say, okay, it's, you could do it. That's, yeah. that's it. It's, I, don't like, know. I don't know. Do they have to yeah. print like 60 billion papers with uh, another gender on it for yeah. some, I, I I don't, I, it's really weird. Yeah. It's, It's really weird to me too, and I don't know all the ins and outs of all that and why it costs this and all that. But just for me, is like, you know, it seems like a, you know, a basic human right that you know, I don't see why it should be such a a big issue. And you know, just even now, there's ads on television that are popping up, you know, against it, and you know, oh, from fuck. certain political parties and stuff, and which just seems really weird in this year we're living in and you know that it's still an issue and um yeah it, that's just kind of all right it, to me it's yeah it should just be a thing like it, it shouldn't you be should, such a should, big issue no one should be talking about it it should be just okay <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah like that's it it should just be there's so yeah, many sweet, problems course, yeah. we have to fix yeah. in our world and Everyone's yeah. like, see, everyone in your continent seems to be talking about that. I mean, we had the same thing in yeah. Germany, but I think on July 1st this year, uh, it was okay to to do it. Like, it's, it's, you can do it in Germany now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another thing that's weird is, you know, like in Australia, it's compulsory to vote and to be enrolled to vote. And, um, Yeah, it's it's everyone's kind of at the moment, you know, to make the your vote count for the same sex marriage thing. Everyone obviously needs to be enrolled to vote, which if you're over the age of 18 in Australia, you should be. And yeah, so many people are just sort of, you know, make sure you're enrolled, and all these people are enrolling to vote now for this issue, which you know, it's obviously it's important, but there's other important issues too, and you know, you know, why haven't People sort of enrolled to vote about all these other issues their whole <laughs> life, and yeah. and now now there's this thing which you know it's going to. I mean, I can't imagine why it wouldn't get passed, and, and it'll be done, and then all right, well, you know now, you know you got to think about the future of other things as well, and like your yeah, your great that, the Great Barrier Reef is like dying. That's that's yeah. from, and I see I see it from a like. 15,000 kilometer away standpoint and I think like man if you let that die uh, it's a huge part of your ecosystem because yeah. that serves the water the water serves the air and then you get better rain condition I don't know you know what I mean like people should really fix that and yeah uh, care about the place we live in absolutely yeah it's um yeah I think you know there's plenty of issues and I mean it's hard to sort of take notice of everything but um you know i think yeah it's just weird to me that so many people are so passionate about enrolling to vote for this one thing yeah and then you know yeah anyway we'll anyway. see what happens i guess but I, i can't imagine why you know it won't get passed but um we'll find out in a couple of months i guess couldn't imagine trump's going to be president if we have it <laughs> well that's it exactly so who knows it, since Since that happened, I'd be like, okay, anything could happen in ever. Yeah. Like nothing yeah. is impossible at all. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah I mean, what would you tell what, your te What would you tell your ten year younger self? Um, If you could talk to him right just, now. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think. I mean, there's plenty of like shortcuts and life hacks I would give myself for sure, but um. I think I was kind of, 10 years ago, I was kind of 
working towards the same path that I'm on at the moment. So I think I would just kind of try and steer myself down that path a little quicker. And, um, okay. Yeah, just some advice to, you know, sort of speed up the process and cut some corners and, and all that. But um, yeah, I think, yeah, definitely 10 years ago, I was kind of still heading down this path that I'm on at the moment. So yeah, I think that's kind of all I'd really talk about with myself. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, we, we talked about um, playing playing sick riffs for um, line check. Yeah. But what makes you angry or disappointed about other artists and upcoming people? Make me disappointed. Um, or angry. Or angry. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, ego is always a, you know, a thing that's kind of a bit disappointing when you, you meet a, you know, an artist who's got a big ego and stuff oh. like that and, and you just kind of think, come on, mate, like, you know. <laughs> Who are you really? Like, and um, yeah, you, you, you're always going to encounter a few of those along the way when you're doing music or probably anything really. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the biggest disappointment is you know when you're trying to work professionally with and someone else and someone and their thinks ego gets he's in way, the way of it. Yeah, yeah, thinks he's way too important. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. What, what do you think you are doing in ten years? Well, that's a good question. Um, that's really good. I I'd came like, up with it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know in 10 years' time I'll be playing music at some, you know, some way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, who knows? Like, it's, it's hard to predict what will ever happen with a band and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, you know, stranger things have, happening, have happened than a band like ours lasting over 10 years. So I'd like to hope that, you know, in 10 years' time we might be still playing and still relevant and, you know, yeah. touring and all that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, it's 10 years is quite a long time. But, it's uh, really long. Yeah. I remember, like, when Parkway Drive had their 10-year anniversary and they couldn't believe it that they were still doing it. And that was years ago now. So, Yeah. Are they playing to 8,000 people on headline shows in Australia as well? I guess not. Yeah, they are. Yeah? Like, okay. They, they, yeah, they've, yeah, they um, definitely do some really big headline shows. They play all the kind of bigger, you know, indoor arenas and, and even some of the outdoor ones, like the, the River Stage in Brisbane. I don't know exactly, but it's somewhere around that eight, maybe 9,000 people. And, wow. Yeah, and they play really really big headline shows over here it's which is one uh, of the f yeah. one of the few extreme metal bands like except slayer and stuff that is yeah. the same size everywhere on the planet absolutely it's yeah. insane it is yeah and it's kind of just always getting bigger as well it's, yeah. yeah it's just it's kind of never slowed down or they've never never really had a backward step it's always just been sort of progressing and yeah it's awesome like the it's super inspiring for someone like me to just see a band continually going from strength to strength and yeah it's um yeah it's amazing really and it seems like they're having fun so that's uh that's yeah. another oh definitely do you do you meet them sometimes like uh or how i thought you know them kind of yeah i mean i'd Uh, back when they were first, you know, in the earlier days, um, they would stay at my house in Canberra with um, my folks and myself okay. um, when they were on tour down there. So that was, you know, sort of back in the earlier days, uh, maybe 2004, 2005, 2006 even. All right. Um, before it kind of really kicked off. And, um, and then, so, yeah, we'd, you know, we kind of knew each other back then. And then sort of as the, the band blew up, You know, you just then you don't really see them around. Um, yeah, of course. Off all over the world. And uh, yeah, but it was cool. Last year, we actually did a couple of shows with them in Australia on um, one of their tours. And yeah, just sort of got to touch base. And and uh, yeah, it was, it was really cool. They, you know, they're still loving what they're doing and still the same dudes that they were back then, even though the band's kind of gone to such crazy levels. Um, but yeah, they're still 
none of that ego or yeah, any of that stuff. It's good it, to hear. Yeah, which was really cool. And um, yeah, it's yeah, it's awesome to see that with all the success they've had that they they haven't kind of you know, lost their heads over it or they're still pretty grounded. And yeah, it was it was awesome. That's nice. That's good to hear because then you have this local band and they act like a million dollars and <laughs> they think they rule the world. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. all the big bands are just so like they're just playing metal we're all just playing metal please yeah calm the fuck down and absolutely go, go jerk off be yeah. before you go to a show or something that you're yeah. you're like on a proper human level totally <laughs> is there other <laughs> things that you wish you would have done earlier um yeah i mean I mean, you, you kind of always wish, especially when you're playing music, that things would just happen. Like, you, you know, you're you're doing a gig and, you you know, you just want the next gig to be bigger or better. And, you know, you just, you always want something bigger and better to happen. So, yeah, you, you know, you're always wishing things would have happened sooner. And, you know, even when you're recording an album and, you know, you just want the thing out. You, you want to finish it. And it always just takes time. And, you know, it's always... One of those things. So I think, as much as you wish things could have happened earlier and sooner, you, you know, being patient is also pretty important when you're doing this stuff. Yeah, fuck ups are I important think, um, as well. Exactly, fuck ups are important because then you learn what not to do as well. So yeah, it's, it, it's um, <laughs> more important than people think. <laughs> it is. Like, yeah, it really is. Doing things really wrong is very important. Yeah. Oh, for sure, and. Most bands have had some huge fuck ups that you would never know about, but um, they've you know they've taken those on board and re reevaluated what they're doing and yeah and turned around and yeah I'm sure a band like Parkway Drive have had heaps of fuck ups along the way and they just you know probably yeah and, yeah and you just wouldn't know about it but um and then some bands they might have a fuck up and you know they just can't handle it and that's the end of the story so. Yeah, I think it's important to yeah to deal with the fuck ups and, and learn learn from them. Cool. Um, do you have any last words that everyone should know? Uh, not really. I think uh, <laughs> I've um, I just want you to finish the fuck you and die album so I can listen to it. Really. Okay, it's gone. Okay, I'm gonna go. And yeah. I'm gonna go and do so it. I want you, yeah. <laughs> After this, I want you to pick up that guitar and. Yeah, I need to. I need to do some writing today. That's that's definitely gonna happen. Yeah, see. Um, who should I have on here? Like, who do you think would enjoy coming on this platform? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I think um, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. There'll be a, quite a few cool. Um, cool people from Australia that, you know, have done different kinds of things. Um, I think we enjoy this kind of platform, but uh, yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, let's have a talk. So, yeah, for sure. Mr. Jeffrey, thank you very much for spending your, my for spending my morning with me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay, uh, have a great afternoon, man. You too, mate. Yeah, and I'll, um, yeah, I'm sure I'll see you in a couple of months when I'm back over there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for listening to this. Um, I think it was a very interesting talk. And as you might have heard in the beginning, I have never talked to Mick without bands playing in the background. So it's pretty cool to actually do it and record it and give you some value. As I said in the beginning, please check out Charity Water. It's a cause that is dear to my heart. Apply for the Facebook group, like not apply. Uh, join the Facebook group if you want to grow. And tell me what you think. How did you like this episode? What didn't you like about it? What do you want to have more of? Uh, let's connect.